All right, so just a bit about tonight's presenter. Tonight we have Diana North up here, and she has been exploring and studying caves and the life within them since she entered her first cave in college. And she saw a pack rat trotting along the cave passages in total darkness. Understanding how life could live deep below the Earth's surface led to her to study who lives in caves, how microbes can dissolve and make rocks in caves, and in the last decade, the impact of the newly emerging fungal disease white nose syndrome in bats in New Mexico and Arizona's caves. She has a PhD in geomicrobiology from the University of New Mexico, and I'm going to let her tell you about some of the some of her work. So Diana, thank you so much for joining us this evening. You can go ahead and click to your first slide and unmute yourself and I'll turn it over to you and monitor the chat for any questions. So I'm gonna start with a little bit about how I entered this world because it is a magical world. But when I was 18 years old, after having a really, really boring childhood, I joined the outing club and I went in my first cave. And that first cave was one that had a stream in it that had holes in it that they didn't warn us about. And I fell in over my head and I was like completely enthralled because this was such a new experience and, and so cool. And I went on to do all kinds of caving in, in experiments and, and experiences. And one of the things that happened to me is early on, they like to teach you vertical work. And back in those days, we tied Swiss harness seats and we were doing a 140 foot deep pit and about 10 feet down, my seat harness started working its way down and ended up around my knees. And I could not convince anyone that I was in trouble. So I bent my knees back and repelled upside down and got this terrible hatred of pits and caves. So I went on to study vertical, uh, horizontal caves for a while. But then you have new challenges. This is Indiana. And in Indiana, this is after a, a crawlway where you have one eye and one ear in the water and, you're, and you cannot move too fast or your air is gone. So we had all kinds of adventures. And for me, even though I was a not very competent caver, it was absolutely a joy. And looking to see what was around the next bend in the cave was always intriguing. And she said, the really cool thing was hundreds of feet from the entrance, I ran into this pack rat. And I was just thinking, how can life live in the dark? How do they find their way in and out of the cave? How do they find food? How do they not fall in a pit? So those were some of the things I went on to explore. And then I discovered that a lot of the life in cave is adapted to living there all the time. This guy has no eyes and you see he's lost most of his pigment and he has extended appendages that help him sense the whole environment. So this introduces you a little bit to the idea of a, pet, of a bat who's flying through these caves, like some of the bats in Carlsbad fly all the way from the very deepest area, minus a thousand feet below the ground. They fly all the way down left-hand passage and up the main corridor and out to feed every night. And you can't help but really admire somebody who's willing to go through a mile, about two to half, two and a half, three miles flying to get out of the cave every night to feed. And then when I, after I had gotten a master studying camel crickets in caves, I actually took a microbial ecology course. And the professor who later became my PhD advisor handed me a little vial and said, pick this in the cave and let's get some cave water and see what's in there. For me, this was like Alice in Wonderland, go, looking down the rabbit hole, because I saw organisms like this that look like a sperm on testosterone. But it's a bacterium. It's something that's one one hundredth the width of one of your hairs. 
And these, there are lots of these in the pools, which by the way, for um, James who's in the audience and is a Lechuguilla caver, there are things like this that you drink in the Lechuguilla pool water. So, <laughs> just, so one of the things over the years that we started to study, I work a lot at El Mapais National Monument and the park asked me, can you find out if we have this terrible deadly fungus that's supposed to be here? So I studied in 2010, I started looking at finding out, did we have the fungus that causes white nose syndrome in the New Mexico case? And that started a long journey. And I wanted to point out on the, I guess it's on the right side for you guys, um, the Northern Arizona University is where we get a lot of our sampling tested. And so they've been really good partners the last couple of years. And I'm gonna talk about some of the work that I've done that they have done all the testing for. Um, how many of you that I can see here, or maybe if you can look in the chat and see, how many of you know what white nose syndrome is? Okay. So most, but not all. Okay. So what you see on those bats, the white on their um, muzzles, which I don't know if you on Zoom can see the, the cursor or the pointer that I'm doing, that white is all fungus. So imagine if you, instead of a mask, your face was covered with fungus. So in the winter, those bats wake up and want to groom because it's pretty uncomfortable to have a face and wings covered with fungus. And they use up a whole bunch of fat stores every time they wake up. And many of them die from just sheer starvation, but it does other things to their physiology that, that's really bad. So we're going to look at some of the work that we have done um, in New Mexico and Arizona, looking to see if the fungus is here and looking to see what clues can we get from the bats about things that might help them combat this deadly disease. So one of the things that I wanted to tell you about is we thought that this fungus, we thought this disease started in Hal Cavern in New York in the winter of 2006, 2007. This is a brand new paper out this year that puts forth the idea that no, probably really started in Connecticut and there was an early spread to West Virginia and New York um, of the fungus. So this is totally different than what we knew before. So the, the knowledge is advancing. And because this is a fungus that uh, was brought here from Europe, we don't know. There are different theories about did a bat come on a cargo ship? Did uh, cavers or other visitors to caves in Europe bring the fungus to the United States? But that's about when it really started. There's pretty good evidence that um, this, the jump to Washington State was done by a human from Mammoth Cave. So we have, the, we have the possibility of making the situation worse or better if we're really careful. So we're, we've been investigating uh, using different methods how we can avoid having this happen in our Western caves. So this is one of the Eastern caves that has huge numbers of bats. And uh, one of the species had 99% of their bats die from it. So we want to avoid coming into a cave and seeing something that looks like this. So you can see here on this map, the spread from wherever, westward and up into Canada, you can see the spread. And I want to point out, if you look at New Mexico, notice that we now have two red marks in there. And that is because this is what greeted a couple of the people who I work with who did the testing in this cave out on the gypsum plains. This is what greeted them this spring. So if you look and you see the white fuzzy stuff on their muzzles, that's white nose. We are not listed as true white nose until a bat dies or we euthanize one and send it in for testing. And we're waiting for them to die of their own, not help them along. Um, so 
we are listed as white nose suspect indefinitely. Um, the, the fungus pseudogymnoascus destructans, that had really, really high amounts of the spores on them. In fact, we were way more positive for that than Texas has been. So this was a big shock. When the people came back and brought me the samples, they were really, really not happy. So this was a tragic spring for all of us doing this work. So here's some stuff about the West that's really important for looking at studies here in New Mexico and Arizona and the West, as opposed to back East. So if you look at this map, notice how red uh, Arizona is and a big part of New Mexico and parts of California. That is where the highest bat diversity is found. And so that's um, something we really want to preserve. We actually have studied 13 different species of bats in Arizona and New Mexico. And I've been to all kinds of meetings where the first thing somebody says to me, but your, coal, your caves are all warm and dry, right? No, they're actually cold and 100% humidity. And some of the caves out at El Malpais, one of the coldest gets down to minus two centigrade, which is about 28 degrees Fahrenheit. So they're really cold and great places for the fungus to survive and in some of them even flourish. And um, we don't know where most of the bats hibernate in the West. That's one of the things because in the West, they don't just use a cave and there's 100,000 there with some exceptions, but they roost, um, they hibernate in talus slopes or in tree roots or places that you might never think to look for them. And so that makes them really hard to find. So this is some um, work that Debbie Beecher that I work with, a bat biologist from Tucson did in the caves at El Malpais. So what you're looking at here is, so this is the relative humidity up to 100, and this is the temperature. And the fungus likes to grow, as you can see here, between two and three and up to like 17. And so in this cave, these were all the readings we got over a couple years of taking readings every, I think, half an hour, an hour. And this is a second cave over there, and you'll see all of the readings we got are dead on in the most appropriate area for this fungus to grow. So we decided actually back in 2011 to start trying to grow the bacteria that live on the bats to see, do they have natural defenses just like we humans have? So we um, combined with a team from uh, Illinois and the US Department of Agriculture. They have a, a two great specialists in the actinobacteria there and started looking at who lives on bats because one of the things we've discovered in the last decade and a half is that the bacteria and the fungi and the, all the different microbes that live on you and in you, they are your military. They are what keep the bad guys out. And so all these decades and decades we've spent trying to kill everything off, on, and in our bodies was totally wrong because that's what keeps you alive many times. So we started looking at who lives on the bats. And luckily, I work with a great bat biologist, and she and I, so Debbie Beecher and, and occasionally Ernie Valdez, have been exploring things in Carlsbad, the, um, the gypsum plains out on the eastern parts of New Mexico, Fort Stanton Cave, El Pais National Monument, up in this area some. And then who's heard of Grand Canyon Parashot National Monument? Only a couple. Okay. So it's a million acres. It's a relatively new national monument. And boy, trying to find the bats there has been a real challenge. But we, luckily, they put out stock tanks and they use them to get water. 
and that's one of the ways that we find the bats. And I've done a little bit down in the southeast Arizona parks there too. So we basically swab these bats. You can see basically Debbie's holding the bat so it doesn't get injured. And I am swabbing the bat. This is one of the cutest bats. I like this little guy down here. Um, and these are Tadarida, and this is a pallid bat. These guys have really sharp teeth. Those are the ones that eat the scorpions. And um, so we're really careful of not to hurt the bats and not to get bitten. And we net in the cave sometimes down in left-hand tunnel. We put nets across. Um, and we net outside, like at Rattlesnake Springs down at Carlsbad. And basically, they bring the bats back, and, and I do swabbing of those. So back east, they have some different bats, but we have a lot of analogs for these. So the big brown bats, this guy is both in the east and the west. This guy, um, the small footed, has an equivalent in the east. And then this is one of the most um, vulnerable in the East and ours out here is Myotis evotis. And then this is one of the ones I really like is the Myotis velifer and it's a cave Myotis. And we have a lot of those throughout as well as the Western Pipistrelle. But these two are of particular interest because this is the Townsend's big ear bat and the silver haired bat. And what's different about them is these two bats get the fungus on them back east or the relative does, but they don't get the disease. So why can they survive this? And the others often die in really large numbers. So um, basically we swab the whole bat and this is turned out to be really interesting. We're swabbing the whole bat because we want to find out who lives on it. And so I need enough DNA. So, but imagine if you were this bat and some monster picked you up and took a wet mop and wiped you all over with it. You wouldn't be real happy. And these guys are not real happy. So I'm very careful not to get my fingers near that mouth. And Debbie sometimes puts a finger there so that they can chew on her because she wears a thicker glove underneath it. So and keeps me from getting chewed on. Um, and we're looking for fungi and bacteria. And once we get all that sequenced genetically, then we have weeks of computer work to do. But one of the things we found this year when we did get real positives, we started comparing that to the work of a grad student in Northern Arizona and the work the National Wildlife Health Center does. And it turns out when you swab the whole bat, you get five times as many positives as when you only swab a forearm and a muzzle, which was something completely new that we just discovered about two months ago. So, I had a grad student, Errol Winter, who took all those amazing hundreds of thousands of genetic sequences and analyzed them and discovered some really important differences. So what a bat has that lives on it in the cave is very different than what a bat will have uh, if you swab it on the surface. So those two are very different in who lives on them. So just like you, when you go to your friend's house, you pick up a whole bunch of new microbes that start that uh, can be found on you. And that's what happens with that. And Era wrote this up. If, if you're really interested in this kind of thing, his article is freely available. And um, basically, there's some other things like ecoregion that determine how it's different. So then we started also, whenever we would do it, besides genetic sequencing, we started growing everything that lived on the bat. And these are one of my favorite. These are what are called actinobacteria. Who's heard of an actinobacteria? Oh, yay, several of you. Cool. So this is where we get a lot of our natural antibiotics. Two thirds of our naturally, that ones come out of nature, come from the actinobacteria. 
So they're a great source. And as you know, many of the antibiotics we have, people are becoming resistant to them. And so this is a way that we can find new ones. Um, and many of them belong to the genus Streptomyces, which we get tons of on the, on the um, bat. So here you can see that swabbing, and this is one of the plates. We did three different kinds of media and really, and we put something in to, so we wouldn't get fungus growing. And then I had somebody who for years basically would then take a plate that looked like that or this or this. So one of these three on the left and would basically subculture it to isolate one colony and then grow that up, extract the DNA and sequence it. And out of that, she got 3,300 different bacteria. Um, and we were targeting actinobacteria. So basically, not surprisingly, this huge number of ones are in the Streptomyces genus. And the other one that's really interesting is the Rhodococcus. This is one that's been shown to kill the fungus on bats. They've actually done an experiment where they put it open petri dishes because these volatilize the compounds that kill the fungal, um, the pseudogymnoascus destructants. And so these are two really important natural defenses. So this is how we did the experiment. So the white in the center is, is, a, is a cave bacteria that's grown up. And then we pour a new dinner on top for the fungi, different, different ingredients, just like vegetarian versus carnivore, you might think. And then we put a whole lawn of this yellow of the fungus, the deadly fungus, pseudogymnoascus. And then we look to see, and this cleared area means that cave bacteria is killing off the P destructants. And so we looked for ones that do that and found that we had some, so the really tall ones, this one and this one, which are streptomyces and, and then the rhodococcus is really good. Those guys can clear the whole plate of the P destructants. And that's what we were trying to find. In working with the USDA guy, we found that um, basically seven of them were new species of streptomyces that had never been seen before. And, and Paris Ham has described two of those species. Um, and, and so they're now freely available in repositories so people can get them and use them for other development of things. And Kenneth, my husband here, um, did the photos like this. He's really, really good at the photos. And so we had, um, for the cover of this uh, journal, they had a contest. And two of the papers, and we were one of them, had a contest to see how much support there was for either photo. And so um, being in the biology department, I mailed them and I mailed all the cavers and I said, go vote. And we won. So we got to be on the cover. So then the other thing we did, and I love the way my grad student Jason Kimball shows this, he basically said, it's sort of like if you took a whole bunch of books, ran them through a shredder, and then had to put them back together. So when we try to sequence a whole genome, that's essentially what you're doing. You're left with this whole pile of genes and trying to figure out who goes with whom and put it into a meaningful genome that will tell you something. And what we were looking for is what kind of secondary metabolites, what kind of antibiotic genes are on these microbes that live on the bats. And these are some of the ones that we found in those genomes that we did, the 20 ones. And the thing that's most stunning about it, if you look at this, on this side, you have the different bats that we did. And then along the bottom, you have how similar they are to known 
secondary compounds, known, known antibiotics or antifungals. And most of them are less than 85% similar to any known compound that we humans have. And especially this guy down here, this bat, the genomes that came off this bat, those compounds are really, really new. They are all not similar to any known compound. So this is a really great place to explore for things that'll help humans combat many of these diseases that we're getting and dealing with now. And Elma Pais wins the race for who had the most um, sequences that were a antibiotic, a novel one. So lots of the places we go have great things. So what we got out of this is a whole lot of new bacteria, many of which produce compounds that are possibly a real help to us, but could kill this deadly fungus that lives on the bats. And um, let's see this. I should actually look at my computer instead. It's really hard to read upside sideways. Um, so we have the right conditions for white nose here. It's only a matter of time, and we've seen the first invasion this spring. But we have bats that have some really great natural defenses, and that may be a help. And that's what we're hoping will come through and, and what we've seen with several of these. So the other thing we're looking at is there is a move afoot to use UVC to kill off the fungus because it's very fragile to UVC. It doesn't have the enzyme it needs to combat this. And so we're, there are people that want to actually UV the walls of the cave and maybe even UV the bats using UVC. So what do you know about UVC? Why would this possibly be dangerous for other reasons, though? Cataracts, OK. Would it cause that in the bats? What about who else lives in the cave? Could it kill off the natives, the bacteria and things that live on the walls? So I found this really alarming. Um, and so we began a study with the help of people from um, Oregon Caves and Klamath Falls and Lava Beds and Mammoth Cave. They got a large grant together for us to investigate this. And these are people, these are people from those different parks that helped us get the money, Alice and Eric in particular. And basically, we're hoping that what Palmer found in this paper, that the differential susceptibility of P. destructans to UV light in comparison to other hibernacula inhabiting fungi represents an Achilles tendon of P. destructans that might be exploited to treat bats for whiteness. But what is it going to do to everybody else who lives in the cave? And that's the concern that we had. So we started an investigation, and unfortunately, it was right at the beginning of COVID. And the first thing they did was shut all the labs for many months before we could get people in. And so that put a real, and the parks shut off the access to all the caves in 2020. So this has been a bit of a slow start to, to do this. So we wanted to find out, can the UV, UVC really, uh, given some of the results we've gotten, can it really work in a cave? And what will the effects be on the native bacteria? Um, and how sensitive are they to the um, UVC? So we work in three caves. We work in Oregon Cave. One of the cool things about it is it's a marble cave. We work in lava beds in Northern California and caves there, and those are lava caves. And then we work in Mammoth Cave in Kentucky, which is a carbonate cave. And we learn some old lessons that are 
very poorly publicized that I'm going to tell you about. But first, I want to note that one of the things we also learned, and this is hard to read, I realize, but these are up on top are the 13 genera. So the phylum is here and the gen or class and the genera is here. These are all genera that overlapped in these two parts, lava beds, uh, I'm sorry, mammoth cave and Oregon cave. And down here are all the unique ones. And so there's a whole lot of things that only exist in one of the caves and aren't in the other areas. That means there's an amazing amount of diversity, cultural diversity, that um, could be harmed by this. So UVC is the really short wavelength. It's the one that ozone blocks um, from harming us. But um, basically, it's very short waved. And one of the things, and it is very germicidal, it will kill things off. And there's a whole lot of research on its ability to kill things off but it damages the nucleic acid, so your genes, and because it forms a covalent bond beyond the, between the different um, bases in there, and those bonds are really difficult to break once it does that. So the cell will eventually die. And the cells have mechanisms to repair UV damage, but, what we didn't realize is we got a whole lot of results where the bacteria weren't dying. And we were like, well, this is weird. Why aren't they dying? Well, it turns out there's a, something called shadowing or shielding, where basically the top layer of cells has taken the hit for the colony, and they die but the ones underneath live. So that could actually be a salvation for the cave bacteria. So we looked, it's kind of like when you wear sandals, that part of your foot is shielded. And so it doesn't get sunburned. So think of it as a, a protective shield that these bacteria have. And it basically, how much UV you use is really important to see whether um, it's going, how deeply it's going to kill within the cells that are on the wall. And so the thing about this, we thought it meant they were resistant. It doesn't. It just means they've got, you know, a thick enough layer to prevent it. So we redid our methods and we found out that in caves, there are organisms that are very sensitive. So that's what you're seeing with this red line. They had die off with the weakest of what we hit them with. Whereas this guy, you know, kept going and then until he finally crashed. And so um, it turns out in the caves we studied so far, and we've done tests on about 100 of our cultures so far, is there are some very sensitive, there are some sensitive, but then there's a bunch of very resistant. So those, some are going to survive. And it's a question of, is it acceptable if you kill off some of the native bacteria, but let the others live to basically help the bat? But that also means we don't really know if this is going to kill things on the bats. If, if they got all that fur, you can't go deep enough. And those spores are still going to be there. So that was a study that, that um, we did with the, the, this partnership with, with several national parks, which we really appreciate the funding that they did. And then I also wanted to talk about, do we humans spread the fungus when we go into caves? And there's been a lot of thought that no, you know, that's not how it's spreading. The bats are the main culprit. Well, yes, they are the main culprit, but there, there are some studies like this one that show that it is possible to spread the fungus with your gear or your clothing 
So we try to be really careful and really wash our gear in the clothing. This has a lot of really big problems associated with it. But uh, we've also discovered that the, the bats actually are still carrying the spores in the summer because I've actually now gotten some positives off of summer swabbed bats and um, that it can stay on the bats. So then I wanted to end with telling you a bit about some of the public outreach that we do, because one of the things I most enjoy is going to the parks and, and or other places and sharing the results we get and why caves and, and bats are so important. Um, and so we do a lot. We take the park rangers into caves with us. And you're seeing one here from Carlsbad, who was helping with this work. And then um, Kenneth takes all kinds of photos of our work. And Elma Pais put together a program, a slide program that they put in the visitor center for um, visitors to watch as they were there. And then the most fun thing we did is I had one of the park rangers write a kid's story. And then I was teaching a freshman course on microbes, friends, or foes. And I had an artist, a just truly talented artist, an 18 year old guy, uh, Stephen Torres, who I paid to do all the illustrations for the book. And so this is a book that the park has on their website. I think it's still there, Ken, isn't it, as a PDF? So it used to be on the Carlsbad website as a, as a PDF. And Stephen did just really cool um, drawings for the thing. So we have had an amazing amount of support over the last 10 years, 11 years from various parks and all kinds of different associations. The Epley Foundation is one that got us started on all that. Um, culturing that we did to find what we could find uh, in the way of secondary metabolites on actinos. And um, Kenneth basically in the very beginning was helping to support the research and um, New Mexico Game and Fish and all these different partners that you see here. This is the work of a lot of different students over the years. And I really want to thank all the stuff they put into this. And with that, I will take questions. This is one of my favorite bats, by the way. Yeah, thank you. What's next? Um, we have to sort out whether they're really going to use things like this. They're also trying, there are some people trying to develop a vaccine. My personal feeling is it's just going to spread, spread through the whole US. I do not think there is a good way to stop this. And the bats are going to have to develop some resistance which I realize is a really pessimistic way to look at it. And I probably would be really roundly condemned by several colleagues, but um, this fungus is really good at spreading and bats are a great vector for spreading it. Um, and, you know, you got 100,000 bats in a cave, vaccinating 100,000 bats doesn't look real easy to me. So, um, we are going to learn a lot out of this, though. I mean, all the stuff about the secondary metabolites and things we've learned about bats and the different bats is enormously helpful. But as far as white nose, I think it's going to spread throughout. We're almost through most of the country. And I think the only reason it isn't in the, noticed in the other states is because we don't know where the bats hibernate. And you just got the really pessimistic view of this. But... <laughs> Um, there are bats that are coming back back east that are surviving and those populations are repopulating. So that's a lot of the hope and that they'll get some more resistance developing. But it's moved really quickly. All right. Thanks, Diana. We have a couple questions coming in from people online, and we can obviously still take questions from people here in person. 
a couple questions about this bat that you're showing right now. Um, what is it? Is it around here? Uh, or is it found around here? Tell us more about your favorite. <laughs> so this one is really cool. This is the Townsend's Big Eared Bat. And it actually is endangered in, in certain parts of the U.S., but we have really good populations of these guys. The, the acronym for them is CODO, which is the Corydnorhinus townsendi, the first two letters of the genus and the species. And, and I really like the guys because they're so cute. And I don't know if you can see it. So no, you can't on this bat. They have a little what are called the trachus. And a lot of times those have mites on them. And, and they look, I think they're really cute, but I am probably not good for the bat. Um, they are a medium sized bat and they are one of the ones that will probably get the fungus on them, but won't get the disease. And that's the really cool thing about them. And in the winter, when you, if you find the earth or when they're sleeping, even in, as they're coming out of hibernation, they curl those ears back and it looks like a ram's horn. And so it's actually really cool. And Debbie is really good at, she can actually just pluck them off the wall or she has a net that she can ease them off the wall very carefully. And one of the things I'm most proud of is Debbie has not harmed a bat when I've been with her in the last 11 years, which I think is just amazing. She's that good with bats. See, what else can I tell you? Kenneth, what else about CODAs? Yeah, they're all over New Mexico. They aren't, I didn't show you a picture of the um, hoary bat. The hoary bat is much bigger and has sort of frosting on it. And it's called the rattlesnake bat because when you pick it up, it goes <laughs> and shakes all over. And I find them really scary. And then the velifer, which I do like, but I call them little shits. Um, because one of them bit me because I wasn't paying attention. It wasn't his fault he took advantage of me not paying attention. There was a bee trying to sting me. Um, what are the other favorite bats? Silverheads are pretty cute. They get way up in, in crevices and coaxing them out is a bit of a trial. Yes. So it's, it's a disease. So Sue is asking, is white nose mainly a disease of bats that uh, live, only live in caves? And I know that, so it's a disease of bats that hibernate. So the ones that hibernate, like in the talus slopes and stuff, they could get, they could get the disease too. Um, the bats are a little more obvious. And the bats that don't hibernate, like the Brazilian free tail bat, are not likely to die from white nose. They are getting the fungus on them, we're finding. And they're probably vectors for spreading it. But they're probably not going to die from it. She's asking for the bats that are really have high mortality, like the little browns that sometimes have 99% mortality. Uh, has everything been lost? And no, there are. In fact, they're finding in the Northeast some colonies that, that have, you know, they're not huge, but there's some recovery and they are finding pockets of, of those. And so they appear to be slowly, slowly recovering a little bit. We haven't lost them all. And a few may have been resistant. Yeah, good news. Sue. So why is the fungus on the bat? So um, what is it getting from the bat? So they are essentially getting, um, they degrade the keratin 
that's in the bat wings, for instance. And so they are getting some nutrition from the bats in a nice warm place to live. Not that they like the warmth. This is a cold loving fungus. So it likes to, as I mentioned earlier, live between three and 17 degrees centigrade. Okay, we might have a couple coming in um, online. Uh, centigrade or Fahrenheit? The three to 17 degrees, it must be centigrade. Yeah. So you might have already answered some of these questions. Um, we talked about which bat species are more vulnerable or are any bat species more vulnerable than others? And then someone else asked, are all or most bats equally success susceptible? So that's about the same. Well, there, there are a couple subtleties that I didn't talk about which bats are, are more susceptible. One of the interesting things is there's a new study out that predicts that the cave myotis, the, the myotis velifer, is going to be the one that's most resistant. I'm not sure that's going to be true. So we'll have to see because it is one of the few that we see a big cluster of. And that's a real risk if you're a bat, if you're hibernating with, with your colleagues or your cronies. Um, the, the <laughs> I don't know if you've ever watched bats, but they really like to cuddle. And, and so, you know, they're going to spread these fungal spores really easily. Um, but they, but the Townsend's bats, we usually see them about a meter apart, just the ceilings littered with them, but they're a good half meter or meter apart. And so some of those bats really, they like it cold and breezy, by the way, whereas others like the air to be still. So we're learning a lot about bats and, and what, where they like to hibernate, which is actually pretty cool. So those are, and the other one that we have that I am really concerned about is the big brown bat. Um, because it has a 40% mortality back east, and we have big browns. And Debbie is a rehabilitator of bats. And she um, basically currently has a pallid bat. And I think she's on, maybe she can type in the chat. At, do you have a big brown Archie? Hopefully she'll put it in the chat. She did have Archie the last time she gave a presentation for us. Okay. And she also has a little pallid, Rosie, which she's been, who's become friendlier and friendlier over the time. And I'm going to tell a Debbie story since I know she's on and she can, can tell me whap, whap, whap next time I see her. But my favorite story about Debbie is sitting at dinner with her at Elma Pais one night. And she's got her cheesecake in front of her, eating it. And on one side, she's got, let's see. No, I'm sorry. The cheesecake's on one side. Her glass of white wine's on the other. And in the center is a plate of mealy worms, of mealy, or mealworms. And she's gutting them because she has this bat who can't eat his own. And so she guts and gives him the gut. And I posted this on Facebook and all my friends went, Wah! and all the Debbie's went, very cool. So So um, she's asking, can we take a swab of a bat that we know is more resistant and take what's been swabbed off of that bat and, and basically swab a bat that is more vulnerable and see if that will help? The problem is that's highly reg regulated. And the experiment that was done with rhodococcus was done in a private cave. 
And so, and I work only in public land caves and there's a pile of basically approvals you have to get to do something like that. And I'm not really great at that kind of work, getting those approvals. So no, I have not done that. We have the cultures though available. And in fact, we're working with a, a colleague at the um, University of Albany who's, she's in her grad student now and he basically selected a whole bunch of the actinobacteria, cultured them and took them home with him. Um, I hope we mailed him. I hope we didn't put him on the plane with a whole pile of culture. Um, and he's basically, they did all kinds of sequences and figure it out. These streptomyces, what are their capabilities? And so they've done a whole big study on that. So we're hoping that with things like that, they're going to be stuff out there to to intrigue people to do all the regulatory stuff that needs doing. Okay, so Mike wants to know how long it takes you to get your test results back. Ah, how long does it take to get my test results? So when I swab a bat to see if there's P destructants in it, the good thing is I have an absolutely amazing person in my lab, a research scientist, Jenny Hathaway, who we bring the we bring the swabs back. And by the way, I also put mine in preservative and put them on dry ice in the field. And I bring them back and Jenny extracts them immediately and sends them to Northern Arizona University. And Katie has been returning the results within two days. So um, she just switched jobs. So we'll see how it goes from here. But they, basically, when you have a team like that, that is so good at working together, it goes really quickly. Okay, so I think this is the last question from online, unless anyone uh, wants to keep typing, we'll of course keep taking questions. Um, so Diana, there was one chart where you showed uh, some unique species found in Oregon versus Kentucky caves. And uh, were there bacteria in those lists that indicate why? Uh, was it the location and what can you do with that information? So actually that's a really cool question because what we're hoping to do with it, because this is not part of the original grant. In fact, I've had to work hard to convince them it's a really good thing to do. But we have an amazing opportunity. We have a marble cave, a lava cave, and a carbonate cave. And we've never compared who lives on the walls across that diversity. And so uh, we know that the, some of the ones that are on the walls are ones that produce antibiotics. We know some have genes to um, basically utilize the iron and manganese that's in the walls of the caves for their energy. So they are what we call rock eaters. And, oh, I didn't put this in. Let me see if I can think what else they can do. Um, there are some that also fix carbon to get their carbon. And so they do some really cool metabolic tricks with all of this. And, oh, there are a bunch of bacteria that are part of the nitrogen cycle. And one thing we've been finding as part of another study at lava beds, where we're also doing this study, is we've been finding that there are archaea. So you've probably heard of bacteria. Many people have not heard of archaea. That's sort of one of the other domains of life. We live in one domain, bacteria are another domain, and the archaea are the third domain. They're what used to be called just extremophiles, like the ones that live in hot springs. But it turns out there's archaea everywhere, and it looks like in caves, they do the first part of the nitrogen cycle where ammonia gets oxidized to nitrite. And this is all part of the cycle that provides nitrogen to the microbes who need it to make their genetic material and other parts. So it appears that um, the bacteria in these caves and the archaea, which we did not culture, 
because they're much harder to culture, it appears that they are fundamental possibly in the cycling of nutrients within the cave. And so there's some really key roles. And so we're actually, I have a student who is working on the AMP scholarship, Christopher Gallegos, who has been comparing, he did the chart comparing these. And, and he is going to be working with me on writing up a paper to compare who lives in these different areas. And so I'm actually pretty excited about that one. I think it will give us a lot of information we haven't had before. All right, thank you. Barbara wants to know, or sorry, one more question came in. <laughs> That's fine. <laughs> You're okay. All right. Uh, Barbara wants to know, instead of limestone, lava, and marble, what about limestone, lava, and gypsum caves? So I guess. Oh, that's a really cool question. Um, so we actually, and this is not, I didn't do this in the presentation, but I had a student who compared who lived on the bats in the, in the cave myotis, so the velifer bats, who lived on the velifer in the gypsum caves versus who lived on the bats in Carlsbad in the carbonate area. And they are fundamentally different. There is much less diversity on the bats that live in the gypsum cave. So um, that's actually something I would love to do more with. But you have to sell out ideas like that. You have to find somebody who's willing to fund that. And I think the Velifer are going to prove to be really different. And so they're one I'd like to keep working on. Okay. Any other questions? Yeah. Any night still young? Here? So she's asking if, with the major die-offs of bats, what's the impact on ecosystems? And I'm going to talk about the impact on the surface first, because that's the really big impact. Um, I don't have it in here, but Debbie has this wonderful slide of how many, how many insects a bat can eat in a night. And it's some fairly substantial part of their weight. And then you multiply that times how many eating, feeding days there are times sort of this many number of bats. And she comes up with like something like 740 elephants worth of insects. So basically, you take out the things that are eating all those insects, farmers, agriculture then has to deal with all those pests on the crops. And so that is a huge economic loss. I don't think we understand. And some bats are pollinators. Like in Arizona, they're the ones that pollinate the uh, suara cactus. And so taking them out of that ecosystem is a really big thing. And then I've also studied mites that live in bat guano in bat cave. And I did not understand that bat guano in July in Carlsbad has 10,000 mites per cup of guano. So if you aren't there pooping on, out new fresh things to feed those mites, and other insects, you're going to have a huge impact on that ecosystem. And yeah, there's all kinds of things that find back on a very attractive. There's a lot of things in caves that eat poop. We once encountered, this is probably not the way to end this. We once encountered some tourist had pooped on the trail and it was covered with cave crickets. <laughs> They were like, yum. So they will eat each other and they will eat poop. <laughs> I don't know which tastes better. <laughs> okay, we need a different question than that to end on. Come on, folks. <laughs> okay, nothing else online. So oh, come on, guys. <laughs> All right, we have one more. One more.
uh, what percentage of transmission of the fungus is direct contact with another bat versus picking it up on the wall. So I had a student who studied where bats get the microbes on them. And we didn't have P. destructans by then, so she just studied others. So I'm using this as sort of a bit of a thing. And she discovered they get a lot of their bacteria from the wall. Now, you can recover P. destructans from the wall. Uh, it's not as good, usually, I think, as the guano, but we don't know a lot about that. But think about the fact that if they've got all those spores you see and they're rubbing up against each other, that's going to be a big transfer. So my guess is it's mainly from cuddling and, and being, because you, you saw that mass down in the gypsum caves. Those bats are really close together. It's how they keep warm. So you're going to probably have a lot of transfer by bats. I think they are really the major agent, but there are other ways to transfer things. I have not studied that, but I think I've seen some reports that, oh, she wanted to know if climate change has affected the climate in the caves. So in general, caves are thought to be the mean annual surface temperature. That is not true at El Mapais because they're cold sinks. But if you're gonna increase the mean annual surface temperature, that is going to impact the temperature in the caves. Now, something like Lechuguilla Cave that's, so James, what is it, 489 meters deep? So something that's that deep, not going to take a long time to impact that. And it doesn't, the air doesn't flow through it. So one more quick question came in online. Um, I want to know if, if WNS has been discovered in cave swallows or any other organisms like bats that live in caves. There, I do not believe it has been, but I don't know for sure. And swallows, because they migrate and they don't hibernate, wouldn't be very vulnerable to it. I have not seen that anywhere, but we're discovering stuff all the time. Like we didn't know Asia had it, and now we do. And they've they've been looking at the genetics of what you know. Ours came from Europe, is what the genetics tell us. But they also looked at have any of the Asian ones come here and did wa the Washington State one? And no, it is related to the European one. So the thought is, and I don't know if this has been updated. <coughs> Sorry. Oh, how are the European bats handling the fungus? What I what I saw years ago was they think it killed a whole bunch of bats off 10,000 years ago. And they basically, that's why the populations are so much lower in Europe. And so you're seeing a long ago the aftermath of a long ago, if that makes sense. Has anybody seen anything different for that? So I think that's what we believe. But, you know, there's new stuff all the time, and our whole view of it changes. So that's the best I can give you right now. All right. Well, your best was was amazing. That was a wonderful presentation. Thank you so much, Diana. And we're having so many people write in on the chat. Thank you. Thank you. And and great job. And um, I'm sure Debbie Debbie appreciated the story. <laughs> um, yeah, is that really what she, she said? Well, <laughs> that that's, that's what I read. <laughs> <laughs> no, Diana, D Debbie did say great job. <laughs> um, okay, so so yes, those are all the questions, and and thank you, thank you, Diana, for sharing your expertise with us tonight. Uh, for those who joined us um, 
uh, in person and on Zoom. Thank you. And please remember to look out. We're going to uh, email a quick survey in the next day or so. And if uh, if you're interested in attending other peak programs, we have some great ones coming up, including uh, our regular Friday night presentation show, our planetarium show. Uh, this Friday is about constellations in the skies in October. And, uh, and then our annual picnic, our, our member appreciation event is coming up on Sunday the 16th. So um, we hope that uh, we see you again. And again, thanks everyone who joined us both in person and on Zoom. And we'll see you again. Uh, check out our website for more things coming up. Have a good night, everyone. <laughs>